Good evening, everyone. It's 6.04. Uh, it's Tuesday night uh, uh, from beautiful Bali. Time for Bitcoin filter number 15. Is it number 15, Vinny? 15. Number 15. All right. Um, welcome, guys. Uh, anybody new tonight? Looks like we got a little bit. Oh, yes. One time only appearance. <laughs> And you're uh, in on vacation, huh? That's right. Yeah. 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 And uh, um, have you heard of bitcoins? You're... Well, I know about bitcoin and the blockchain, sort of. I'm more interested in understanding that stuff and where I can get started in that. I think I missed the boat on bitcoin a bit, but yeah, I'm just, okay. just going to find out. All right. Well, welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> all right. So. Um, Tonight we're going to uh, cover a little bit of local news, uh, a little bit of um, international news, stuff that people have posted on the Bitcoins in Bali Facebook group that I've got up here now. Um, and uh, we're going to talk tonight, uh, based on popular requests, about inflation and deflation, which sounds boring, but uh, we're going to try and make it interesting. Um, but first, as always, let's uh, let's take a look at what's going on with the price. Um, we're at 568. You can see um, it's been a precipitous drop today. I have no idea why. I didn't see anything in the in the news that would uh, um, cause this dip. So it's probably just uh, who knows. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of people that are participating in this market by now, and uh, things change. Things get pushed around. Um, Bitcoin's really trying to find its price in the world, so it's still quite volatile. Um, compared to last week, uh, I think we were at, uh, um, were we below, were we below seven last week? Yeah. We, we, uh, I think we were at, um, this is the total market cap of all Bitcoins in the world, worth about $7.4 billion. Uh, there's 190 currencies in the world, and uh, Bitcoin is ranked 88th amongst all those currencies in terms of uh, M1 money supply, which is the uh, um, basically the coins and, and paper money. Um, <coughs> that's what it compares to that, uh, that score there. Um, if we look at the Indonesian exchange, uh, Bitcoin's the last trade was for 6,300,000 rupiah on Oscar's exchange at bitcoin.co.id. So someone was, was um, buying and selling a lot right there. You, you posted, Stephen, you posted something when that happened. because yeah, I was buying and selling a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that you? Is that you? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, not, no, no. <laughs> the, uh, they were at over 100 Bitcoins today. Oh. They rarely get uh, the exchange rarely. Yeah, they about range. Here's 50 the, Bitcoins a day is usually their max. Here's the volume, yeah. and uh, they did between... $600,000. So. Yeah, they, wow. they usually do between 25 and 50 Bitcoins. This is really interesting. You know, uh, um, I had uh, lunch with Oscar, and we talked a little bit about just the market here in Indonesia. And um, if you if I come here to our little calculator, right now we're 5.9, 5.29% below the global average of 5.68. So on uh, Oscar's exchange, you can get bitcoins for about 5% less than you can anywhere else in the world. And I asked him, you know, why is that? Why why is it that Bitcoins are less expensive in Indonesia than elsewhere. And, you know, nobody really knows, but the speculation is that uh, we have cheap electricity in Indonesia, so there are likely a lot of uh, mining operations in Indonesia. Um, and uh, many of those uh, Indonesian mining operations may or may not have access to bank accounts outside of, the, uh, outside of Indonesia in which case they would need to liquidate their Bitcoins here on Oscars Exchange. If there was a, a hefty supply of Bitcoins, that would, uh, that would cause the price to be below market. So it's great for us, though. Um, we, get, we get our Bitcoins at a discount here. Isn't the so. slow internet give the miners a problem? Uh, I don't know. I don't, and I don't know anybody that's got a mining operation in, in Indonesia either. So. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that my, my uh, blockchain transactions clear very quickly, but I think that happens <laughs> everywhere. Um, so it's, it's up to you to decide why that's the case, but uh, it's fun to, to speculate and, and figure out or postulate why that might be the case, but we can 
we can all be happy that it is the case and, and buy our Bitcoins for less than everybody else around the world. This is also a, an arbitrage opportunity. Are you, are you guys familiar with the term uh, arbitrage? Yeah, yes or no? Yeah. Basically it means that you can buy uh, something in one place and sell it in another at a profit. So, um, anyway. Some countries that uh, about it's just a question. There, there are. The exchanges here, actually this is the, the tool that Andrew Golightly has put together and he's constantly uh, tweaking it. He added the Cripsy exchange recently. Um, and these are all the exchanges around the world where you can buy and sell Bitcoin. Um, you can see that uh, the uh, somebody on Oscars exchange has them for sale at 538, but somebody on local Bitcoins is selling for 635. So if you could buy your Bitcoin here and sell it to whoever's buy, whoever's uh, Buying for 635, then you could make uh, what is that? It's like a hundred dollars. Oh wow! Uh, on, but there's only point there's only 0.78 bitcoins for sale at that. Exactly. <gasps> Hello, welcome. Thanks for coming. But uh, he's also got the profit percentage per exchange over here to tempt you into getting into the arbitrage game. Be very careful, but uh, it's fun to think about. Anyway, uh, moving on, um, the coin map. I don't. We don't usually look at the the big worldwide coin map. So I wanted to show you guys what's going on here. It's kind of interesting. You've got you know hundreds and thousands of locations accepting Bitcoin in North America and in Europe. Um, uh, of course, more activity going on down in South America, Australia. But when you uh, when you zoom in, you can kind of see that there's a bit of a hole here in, uh, in Southeast Asia. There's no red dots. If any of these dots could, turn in, could represent 100 merchants that accept Bitcoin, then the dot would turn red. So really, you know, we're trying to build a, an economy here, a Bitcoin economy here in Indonesia and specifically here on Bali. And um, I, I believe it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing happening where, you know, there's only... 22 places here. Let's zoom in a little bit. On Bali, there's there's 18 places where you can uh, trade your Bitcoin for uh, goods or services. Can I just for a show of hands? Has anyone um, spent their Bitcoins at a location in Bali? These two. Um, so only two people out of a room of about I don't know 20 people have actually spent Bitcoins, and it. I was gonna. Uh, say in the last week, but that was forever. Everyone else has not spent bitcoins in Bali. I'm just curious: is it because you don't have bitcoins? Is it because you're holding on to your bitcoins? You don't want to spend them. You don't have bitcoins. Who has bitcoins but has not spent them in? Okay. So, so the slide who sells memberships for bitcoin? Hey guys, welcome. Come on in. Welcome, welcome. With the current exchange rate between the U.S. dollar and the Indonesian rupee, there's no way I'm going to spend bitcoins in Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I just want to. The exchange rates. I, I suspected that that would be the case. That there would be people, a lot of people with Bitcoin, but they weren't spending them. And I just wanted to, I don't know, share a bit of philosophy, my own ph philosophy around that. I have, I have bitcoins as an investment, um, but I also look for every opportunity to spend bitcoins. Because that supports the economy, really. It makes the, the currency more useful. So uh, if, the, if the Bitcoin is circulating in the economy, then that's good for Bitcoin because it becomes useful as a currency. Um, and you, you overcome some of the chicken and the egg thing that we've got going on where, you know, I've talked to merchants who say, you know, well, there's just not enough traffic. No one's asking for Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, I don't, maybe I'll wait and see what goes on. And then there's people who have Bitcoin. Maybe, maybe not even in Bali right now, um, thinking, where should I go? Oh, there's only 18 places in Bali that accept Bitcoin, so maybe I'll go to Europe instead. So um, what I do, question? Uh, no question. Uh, uh, accepted a Bitcoin. Oh. Part of a Bitcoin. As a. Wait for the account to sort of be properly set up to be on the map or something. Okay. Yeah. So you're a merchant and you've accepted Bitcoin as payment for your services? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's good. That's cool. Well, Oh, okay. Yay. Two people in the room. Three, four. Ah, so, okay. 
Oh, yeah, okay, what? I'm sorry. Yeah, please. But a couple of things about the stat. I mean, it's deceptive for a couple of reasons. One of them is that a lot of us who are actually here that do accept Bitcoin aren't on this map for a variety of legal reasons, right? So uh, it's underestimating the total. Okay. Second, if you look at what's on that list, 25, 30% is accommodations. None of us in here are looking to rent a short-term accommodation or a hotel mm -hmm. room. So we're not going to be spending on those kind of venues. So it's yeah. a bit of a, to look at that engaged flow by the people that are in this room, et cetera, et cetera, is I don't think a very accurate indicator of the, the, the Bitcoin economy involved. Gotcha. And there's a third okay. death that too, which is that you're just going to put in location, also can't get on that map. Yeah, yeah, there's services, okay. businesses that aren't on the map. And they can that's find right. the, they can find those uh, otherwise, but and that's a good point. Um, but uh, I think I think it's interesting to think about how we can spur the Bitcoin economy. If you have bitcoins, then it really is in your interest to see it circulating. What what I do is I look for opportunities to spend it, and then whatever I spend, I replace. So I just kind of create my own little um, ecosystem. yeah ecosystem. And uh, with the, the hopes of promoting the economy as a whole, because I know if, this, if the economy does take off, it, if it actually circulates and becomes useful as money, that the demand for it will go up and therefore the, the price will go up. And um, I just think it's, uh, it's exciting to think about Bitcoin circulating as, as money, um, but we're not there yet. Uh, when I speak to Big I post on Facebook, and then one of them, my tech friends here, Oh, are you like one of those guys that's been twenty two bitcoins by a pizza and that's worth like a hundred thousand dollars or whatever it was? <laughs> and I said, Yeah, but it would never reach a hundred thousand dollars if I'd never spent them. Yes. Yeah. Well and given that there's a, a liquid market now, you can simply just replace your bitcoins after you've spent them. I mean it's a it's a more of a hassle than just handing the economy, right? Yeah. We're 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 like I feel like we're we've got a little fire and the kindling <laughs> is just like kind of crackling and that's uh we're, we're early days yet, but also if you if there are places that you wish accepted Bitcoin, like you said, there's most of the places don't really fit your profile for wanting to spend. Um, let us know because we're trying to find businesses to approach. Um, I don't think we're ready to like advertise in the newspaper and say start accepting Bitcoin, but if there's individual merchants that you think would you know if they accepted it that it would make a splash and that it would be really interesting for the community as a whole if if they accepted Bitcoin, um, ho well, maybe I'll ask the question on the forums. But I spoke to a couple of uh, cash leaders because I know the owners, and they're kind of looking at it. Is it a phase? Was it kind of one of those things that just keeps people get into? Mm -hmm. uh, and he's like, yeah, of course you should get into it because you're on forum internet kind of things. But so he's yeah. just, am I just jumping on a, a bandwagon for the sake of it? Yeah. So that's some decisions. Yes. No, thanks for sharing that. And I think that's legitimate, you know, especially for, for businesses that, uh, you know, it would be more of a hassle than would increase their business. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, we're in that area where, yeah, we're trying. Still the fear factor? Yeah. yeah I didn't mean to say it right now. Um, <laughs> because I talked to my mom about it earlier, just kind of on Skype, and she freaked out like a flunk to the scam. I realize mm -hmm. that she watches the news right. and they're portraying it like this shitty scam. So if you're not one of us, you're going to think it's a shitty scam. Yeah. Is that what it's perceived like at the moment? On the I, my mom was talking to my brother the other day and, and he can't separate Mt. Gox from Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. Oh, really? you know? She right. told me, wait, didn't Bitcoin crash? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a very easily, like, short, maybe one page printout or maybe a couple of minutes? Yeah. We're going to. Like or whatever, or what that like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, we've actually, um, at the end, I'm going to make a bit of an announcement about Bitcoin 101 class. We've got it on the calendar now. So she's not a plant. We, uh, we didn't plan this. <laughs> but we are. <laughs> Understand it from a non-technical point. How am I going to go and say, "Hey, sacred secularities who get you know hundreds of people into Bali each year from all around the world, you should sign up for Bitcoin. It's not going to cost you anything. Read this one page." Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that sounds like a good idea. Where's that video? Right? It's yeah. like a five-minute video. Five minutes too long, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm really sorry. I'll make a ten-second video. Like Bitcoin. Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. like, no, this is a this is a. About two and a half minutes or a one. 
they want to read. There's a great consultancy with Patrick Walsh. <laughs> it's a it's a quandary. It's um yeah. we're at that stage where um you know not not everybody knows about it and you only have people's attention for a short time on new ideas. Um, really, it, it may just take time for it to soak in to the to the consciousness of business owners and just the general public. And but it's okay because we're not you know the small community is not ready yet to support. You know, if, if everybody wanted Bitcoin now, we wouldn't. Uh, you know, we might not be ready for that. So it's okay. We'll uh, we'll take the take it as it comes. But it, but again, if there are individual businesses that you know it'd be you know you'd like to see Bitcoin accepted there. If they accepted Bitcoin, you'd spend it there. Especially, I'd be interested to learn what those are. So. All right, so now we're going to get into a few of the things that were posted on the Bitcoins in Bali group um, by various members. I think this one was uh, posted by Andrew Go Lightly. Um, have you guys ever wondered why Bitcoin has a large B sometimes and a small B other times? Yeah. And, uh, yeah? Okay. <laughs> um, well, Bitcoin is, is two things, right? It's... The Bitcoin as the currency, you know, the you know, I own a Bitcoin, that's a lowercase b, but Bitcoin, the network, the thousands of computers around the world that are running Bitcoin software, make up Bitcoin big b the network. So if uh, if Bitcoin were to crash, then they'd be referring to the the, the network, but uh, Bitcoins can go down in value because you're referring little b to the the coins themselves. <laughs> oh, you have <laughs> really. <laughs> well, you know, it's not a. Th this is, this is a convention. You know, this is this is something people say it's true. So they're, you know, is it true? Is it not true? People, people are kind of making noise that this is how we should refer to these things because it becomes confusing otherwise. But there is no, uh, there is no Bitcoin CEO pounding his gavel saying this is the truth. This is a. Uh, this is a convention. It, it kind of reminds me, there's another thing going on that people are trying to decide on, and that is where do you put the decimal place and how, what are the denominations of Bitcoin? Because it's, really, it's not really practical to, to if you're going to buy something very small, like a pack of gum, it's 0 .000823 Bitcoin. So there are certain people that want to create this uh, vocabulary around a smaller denomination uh, um, um, millibit, which is one one thousandth of a bitcoin. Uh, one millibit is uh, right now about fifty eight cents or sixty cents, um, whereas one bitcoin is five hundred dollars. So that's what happens when you move the decimal place over and then you call it something new. Is that confusing for people? <laughs> and a satoshi is a is small one one hundred millionth of a bitcoin. <laughs> yes, that's another denomination. The satoshi, the smallest denomination of bitcoin. One one hundred millionth is called a satoshi after the founder. We can extend with that. We can have more. That's more than later. Million? Hopefully, we'll get to that day. When, Wait, when are you, you telling me that Bitcoin can be divided by more than hundred million? Yeah. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, well, actually, we'll get to that a little later on in the discussion. But I'll talk about. I'll talk about. Yeah. I'll. We'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> um. Here is uh, another news item posted in the Bitcoins in Bali group. Um, those are the Winklevoss twins. Does anybody know who the Winklevoss twins are? Yeah. They were famous for something else besides Bitcoin a little while back. If you, if you saw the movie The Social Network, you could. Famous incestuous brother. They were, didn't they, weren't they Olympic rowers too? They these, guys, these guys have an interesting life. Um, but they're, they're trying to get an exchange traded fund created around Bitcoin. Has everyone ever seen this thing called an exchange traded fund? And are you maybe you've seen it? This is a, a Wall Street creation, an, another fictional object like money itself. Um, that uh, essentially what they're doing is they're trying to make Bitcoin palatable for Wall Street by creating a fund where it's not actual bitcoins, it's shares that represent bitcoins, right? They do this with gold and silver as well. Where you know I want to, uh, I I want to invest in gold, but I don't want to create a vault and stick some gold in there. So I'm going to buy this exchange traded fund that says for every share I can redeem it for one ounce of gold. 
right? But what happens when you do that is there ends up being more paper representation than the actual thing that you're representing. And it allows you to do fractional reserve banking, which uh, um, is something that Bitcoin was created to, um, to keep from happening. So it's a little bit, it's interesting that, you know, this amazing invention of Bitcoin comes along and then people try and put it in the box, of the old box and the old, the old way we're used to thinking about things. But um, funny enough, it might be a, a good thing for Bitcoin itself. It's a little publicity. Oh, Will, it looks like I make the difference. <laughs> um, I always want to create like a situation where people are fighting, so it's more interesting. For <laughs> Um, if, if this allows people's grandmothers to, to get involved, if this is good publicity for Bitcoin, um, it's, who is that, was it Mae West that said, um, I don't care what you say about me in the papers, just spell my name right or something like that. Um, anyway, any news is good news kind of thing. Um, I won't be buying in, any ETF shares of Bitcoin. I, 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 it's against my thoughts of what's religion, what's sound for my own investment. Really just create an opportunity for a middleman, which is like essentially the whole problem with currency yeah. in the first place. Like shorting. 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 Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it, it does. Like it creates fractional unity. The, the winkle loss is up here like the price. Yeah. 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 Yes, Why yes, good, price? yes. And that, yeah, so, and that would be bad. Um, if you, if you can create a bunch of Bitcoins that are just on paper and then sell those in the open market to okay. manipulate the price, then, uh, then maybe that's no bueno. I'd also say that we should be able to solve that because, like, all an ETF is is like a in programming speak, it's an API, it's a gateway. It's a very easy to use interface into something that's usually hard to obtain. Mm -hmm. But in Bitcoin, it's actually you know it's kind of hard right now because people don't understand it well. But we can make that really easy. Then there's no reason to. Right? Yeah, then there's no reason to change the stockbroker to Bitcoin. That's true. Right. The the other thing you can do is if the exchange traded fund, if if its customers demanded, they could know exactly how many bitcoins they have uh, under their control. It's proof proof of solvency, basically, because because the blockchain is transparent, they could actually prove to their users the reserve ratio they're operating the fund with. That's what I'm Christian. Yeah. You could do that. That is possible. And the Winkle Fund don't have the best track record with startups anyway. Their last, <laughs> their last one just shut down a couple of weeks ago. Oh, really? I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, there was another one. Their New York office laid off their entire staff. Yeah. He's just a Facebook guy. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. The guys who missed out on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're Facebook. See, now I'm not even looking at Facebook. I trust them less than the guys who made Facebook. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. They, they, they commissioned Mark to create Facebook. Well, Mark. they they fine. <laughs> yeah. Everybody was working on it. This, Everybody. It was like this, 20, 30, 40 of these guys. Yeah. Yeah. This is just part of what makes Bitcoin good spectator sport. I get these guys showing up every now and again. They, they narrowly <laughs> kind of escaped because they, they those guys there. Well, they funded the startup and they, that founder got done for money laundering. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, because he was involved with Silk Road. And, and, um, oh, and is that Silk Charlie Road. Shrem? Uh, okay. Well, I would be interested. I, th these are all things I didn't know. I didn't know the their venture went under. I didn't know about this uh, other venture they were involved with that got done for money laundering. So maybe we can post those things in the notes. Um, okay, moving on. Um, this item was um, posted by Roberto, who I think is uh, currently in Italy, but he's still participating in the group. Um, looking forward to his return. Um, but this is an interesting, you know, it's good that he posted this because he had a hacking event where someone stole, not Bitcoins, it was NXT. Um, he actually recovered those NXT. That's, that whole saga is documented in Bitcoins in Bali. If you go back and look, he, he uh, basically described the whole story about someone hacked his computer and then he tracked the cryptocurrency after the fact and then got his Bitcoins back, or his uh, NXT back, I should say. Uh, but then he posted this, which is fascinating. There was um, some sort of old exploit, this BGP hijack exploit. This is uh, something that existed back in the 90s. What does it stand for? I forget. Anyway, it's, it's a security exploit that has been around for quite a while. This guy repurposed it to intercept internet traffic 
from 19 different ISPs that were servicing mining operations. Uh, I'm sorry, mining pools. Um, so all these guys that were, were participating in the mining pool, when the block reward would happen, the bitcoins would go to this guy's account. Sneaky. Yeah, very sneaky. Uh, they, they think he may have uh, gotten about $83,000 worth of uh, funds, but maybe not because if you read it, it's funny. It's like the guy like got sick in the middle of the study, so it might be more money than that. <laughs> but in any case, uh, it's um, – the other interesting thing about this story is it was Dell researchers that uncovered the, the exploit. And as you know, we announced last week uh, that Dell is now accepting Bitcoin as payment. So it looks like they're also uh, sicking their, their uh, researchers on, uh, on some of the problem. Yeah. So, That's an interesting Yeah. It is. I like the company. That's cool. Okay, moving on. Okay, so now we're ready to talk about uh, um, inflation. But before I do, were there were there any news items this week that anyone wants to bring up to discuss or talk about? I have one small thing. Yeah. So I am bringing up uh, sort of copyright again. If anybody was here, they saw my copyright talk. Ah. Um, you'll know that I do that. So of course I do accept Bitcoin. Um, if For copywriting like, services. Copyright skills, oh. yeah. right. So if you want more skills, if you have something awesome that needs to be sold or converted better. Eddie accepts, Eddie accepts Bitcoin for copywriting. For copywriting. Okay. Yeah. Did you already put that on the Bitcoins in Bali? Not yet. I will. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Let us know. Do a little free advertising. Hello. Yes. Come on in. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, there was also another coin being called Dreadcoin. Dreadcoin? Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> Did that actually come into uh, existence now? So, was that is that the first cryptocurrency born in Bali? Well, possibly, yeah. 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 All right, maybe we need to do a press release or something on that one. And um, and that's worth uh, how how many? Is yeah, it? Worth no, it's worth it's worth some dreadlocks, right? Or well, like, uh, <laughs> okay. 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 So what is it? So do, do, do maybe we – well, if you know enough about Dreadcoin to tell us, we'd love to hear it, or do we want to wait until – did Peter help you with this? With some, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. well, I know about the ground yeah. implementation of it. Yeah? Stuff you guys probably don't know. Well, do you want to describe it for us now, or do you want to – am I putting you on the spot? No, no. Okay. Um, tell us. Where it's going to start, it's going to become more of an online forum, and there's – around the world, there's X amount of – Dread creators or competitions, as we call ourselves, uh -huh. and we have probably unique access to massive amounts of community where people do lawyers, doctors on my client list, um, festival people, people who make food, you know, grow their own food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. So there's a whole community of, of folks. Yeah, and so hopefully, what will happen is it will become more of a bartering system. So I won't charge for my services. I can barter that around. Uh -huh. um, but the sort of forum will be whoever sort of contributes to the content mm -hmm. in that forum should earn some dread coin. Um, oh. Then that can be traded with people like photographers and models um, who go out and because we send our stuff out to photographers and models all the time. Uh -huh. um, so I'm not really 100% sure how the actual coin part of it will work and how uh -huh. it's going to get dispersed. But basically we're going to start up a forum where the Dread community is massively strong online. It's already like about 3,000 strong that contribute to a particular community. Mm -hmm. um, and from that, it will just sort of we'll add whatever it is that we need mm -hmm. to that community and other people contract with it through Dreadcoin, Bitcoin, through whatever other coins they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can also do part payments for cash. So say I send a set of synthetic dreadlocks to a model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can earn dread coin for that. Mm -hmm. I earn publicity for that. Yeah. The photographer earns the rights to put their name on that model's photo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, whoever has done the research for it on how to make it. Sort of a handful of us who have actually done the correct research. We can earn coin by contributing to these forums and answering questions. 
I guess people can earn coin by posting pictures and asking questions. I think that would be really, really beautiful. Uh -huh. um, and really just anyone who interacts with it, sort of think of it more like festival coin. I don't want to say hippie coin because <laughs> by definition I'm not a hippie and I think we are hippies. But it's, I see it as this global thing because most of the dread people, we're online, we're all connected, we all sort of know each other. But it's going to work in a tiny little microcosm mm -hmm. where our communities, literally the people around us, can retain the value within the community um, and that community can grow and prosper, sort of like concentric circles all around the world. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, there have been communities, even before Bitcoin came along, and Stephen can comment on this maybe too, is the there are local currencies that have arisen around... Uh, different geographies, right? But now we've got the geography of the internet, right? And so because of this technology, you can coalesce a local currency for not a geographic locality, but an interest locality. This is being done with other uh, communities, um, and uh, perhaps it will work for your community too. It's a really interesting project. I, w I wish you pretty much already working for the community. This is, I just think, a decentralized system uh -huh. where I don't have to work <laughs> out that my dreads are worth X amount. They're worth the exposure or or, sort of or the, maybe the market figures out what it's worth. Yeah, the market completely figures right. it out. And the market is that small subset, that community subset of you guys yeah. who are interested in that. Well, That's great. Maybe dread pit. <laughs> Dread.it. Yeah. All right. Keep keep, keep us posted. Right. The Dread Forum, is that for anybody who's Dreadcoin? Is there a type of person who's supposed to attract to this? Like, what's the target audience? Um, the target audience, I guess, without doing a whole lot of market research, and it's mainly in my head, um, <laughs> is people who go to organic markets, um, people who go to festivals, people who want dreadlocks, any IT people at all, because most dread people are creative rather than techie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's really... I guess I'm sure pretty nomad people too, right? Very much nomad people. Sweet. Very much so. <laughs> yeah. And it's sort of, there is so much going on within that community. There are so many different facets, like fiber artists, for example, connecting um, people who make yarn to somebody in Iceland who makes yarn dreads. I in Australia have access to amazing, you know, locally made yarn. So how do we get that from there without having to increase the cost dramatically and that person doesn't actually get the amazing yarn? Yeah. No, this is a... So to me, there's a lot of people. And if I just look down my client, just me, you know, and I've only really been in the dreadlocks business for like two and a half years, like my client list goes from... You know, somebody on with like government benefit, not doing anything, all the way up to lawyers and doctors. Like there's that entire spectrum in between, and all of those people interact with Dreadcoin. And one thing that I and so many other Dread people spend a lot of time doing is connecting these people because they need each other, but they just don't have access to each other. But now here's the forum, and here's a way for. People right. who are unlike me to understand it and to put trust in it. Don't trust me. Trust all these other people that's independently verified. Right. No, this is really great. I mean, this is um, we saw this happen with Dogecoin, where the the Doge meme existed and the Doge community existed before Dogecoin. Right. Then uh, someone, some nerd, came along and said, "Let's make Dogecoin," and then it took off in this community that probably wouldn't have known anything about cryptocurrency otherwise. Um, right, right. And so we'll watch with interest. Thanks for uh, sharing that. Um, I really invite all of you to please post your skills. Yes. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Yes, let us know. One fact about Dogecoin. I found out that the founder, when he released it, he released it thinking it was a joke, so he didn't mine much Dogecoin, which means he never, like, he never got much Dogecoin. You never got the whole rich thing because it picked up. You well, know. it's funny. That that may be why it succeeded because lots of coins do all their pre-mining and then a pump and dump marketing campaign and then the people who got an, uh, people who created it make all the money and everyone else is left holding the bag. But, but anyway, okay. So now we're going to move on to the exciting portion of tonight's programming, uh, inflation and deflation.
hopefully we can make this uh, interesting. Um, I've, I've posted this graph a number of times. This is the money supply in the United States. Uh, this is a, a graph provided by the Federal Reserve. And um, you can see that over the course of my lifetime, the, the money supply has been growing at a pretty predictable rate. Um, and does anyone know what, uh, what kind of where we are there date-wise? Yeah. Fall of 2008. Um, Filing out the banks. Right. So um, this is, I think you could show this to like a 12-year-old kid and he might say, think, he might be able to point where the problem is. <laughs> uh, this, this is the money supply. Uh, it has quadrupled since 2008. So it took my whole lifetime to get to about a, a billion dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, a trillion dollars. Now we're up around four trillion dollars, right? This is this is what's called uh, quantitative easing. You know, they're not they don't call it we're going to triple the or quadruple the money supply. They call it quantitative easing. Um, and uh, you know, this is really when you get down to it, the definition of inflation. What are you inflating? You're inflating the money supply, right? We try and measure it in ways, you know, the consumer price index and um, you know a basket of goods. But when you're talking about inflation, what is inflating is the supply of money. That's that's what you're referring to when you're referring to inflation. People think it's inflating prices or prices going up, but but really what it means is the inflation of the supply of money. Um, and uh, as you can see, in the case of the U.S. dollar, it is highly unpredictable. At least in the last 10 years, let's let's take a look. Let's spread this out a little bit. This is the last 10 years. You can see that it was very predictable and then in here we've, we've, uh, we've kind of gone off to the races. Um, and incidentally they announced last fall that, that QE was coming to an end or they were going to taper QE. I don't know if you guys have read. And so here's the last year. You can see that we have continued to increase the money supply um, at quite a rate. Take it easy Eddie. Thanks for coming man. Uh, so I just thought I'd kick off the discussion with that. Let's compare that to Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin doesn't have a central bank that, that decides on the money supply. Uh, it happens based on an algorithm. And uh, you can see that this, you know, every 10 minutes, 25 Bitcoins are, uh, every 10 minutes, 25 Bitcoins come into existence based on the mining process. And every four years, the amount of Bitcoins that, that are earned goes in half. So we've actually already uh, experienced one of these halvings. We'll have another one here and here and here. So um, this is the inflation rate of Bitcoin. And this is the actual number of Bitcoins that will come into existence over the next 100, 100 years or so. 2140 is when we'll see the last Bitcoins created. So this happens based on math. It happens based on an algorithm and the inflation will we'll never you'll never see a graph like this in Bitcoin where somebody decides that oh my god we need four times as much money as we did ten years ago right it, it will it will follow this curve um, do or die you know the the lack of flexibility might mean that Bitcoin you know gets usurped by in some other coin that does this better but Bitcoin will always follow this curve which is interesting from a from an inflation standpoint. What's the uh, version of money that this slide was? The version of money? You mean the, uh, this is the M1 money supply. So, source base. One thing that, that's interesting is um, I've, the, the title of this graph has changed a lot in the last, I, I've shown this graph quite a few times and I noticed that uh, it used to say um, base money supply and now it says St. Louis source base. <laughs> and that, I think that's fascinating that they changed the name of the graph because it seems a lot more nebulous, this title to me, but in any case. Um, so when you're talking about, it, I just wanted to define our terms because when, when you're talking about inflation, you're talking about in, inflating the supply of money. This is what's happening with the dollar. This is what has happened and will happen with Bitcoin in terms of the money supply, it will grow at a very predictable rate, right? 
And so that leads us to a series of articles that I'm, I'm going to talk about, and that is um, this first article floated by The Economist uh, called Money for Nothing, Chronic Deflation May Keep Bitcoin from Displacing Its Fiat Rivals. Now, um, Bitcoin, even though it inflates over the next 100 years, as you saw, is referred to as a deflationary currency because uh, everything in the world tends to become uh, um, less expensive in terms of Bitcoin, right? So the first person to transact with Bitcoin bought a pizza for 10,000 Bitcoins, right? But now you can buy a pizza for 0. 0.0005 Bitcoins, right? So that's, the, that's why they call Bitcoin a deflationary currency, right? And economists use this terminology as a weapon because, well, I don't know about you, but growing up in the States, they were always talking about, oh, we might enter a deflationary period, and that's bad, right? And um, the, in my opinion, we've really been trained that deflation is a bad word. Um, it is bad um, if, you're, if you're the government because it makes it hard to tax. Um, essentially, if you've got a deflationary currency, let's say that I make you know, 100,000 Bitcoins a year, and next year Bitcoins are worth 20% um, more, so I can buy 20% more goods and services with my same 100,000 uh, Bitcoin salary, right? That means that they're not taxing that 20% more, more value that I get for my, my Bitcoin than otherwise. Whereas if I was in a U.S. dollar-based account and I made $100,000 $100, and next year I got a raise to $120,000, then they could tax that 20% gain. So the, so governments will have a problem with an economy that runs on a deflationary currency because, well, it keeps them from being able to collect tax in the old way. It really, I, I think it opens up an opportunity for a voluntary tax system or a, a more democratic tax system, which I absolutely think can work. You, you know, if, if we have a little community here in Ubud and Ubud needs something that's good for all of us, we can form as a community and, and decide everyone chips in and they pay for it. That happens on the small scale. Um, I, I think it can happen on a large scale, but until that, until that changes, governments will have a problem with deflationary currencies. And isn't it exciting that uh, governments would be so upset? I, I can make a comment <laughs> about that. The reason I'm interested in blockchain is, is not so much currency, but more governments specifically. Mm -hmm. And the ability for people with the blockchain Let's say any issue you can think of the government brings up, everyone can have a vote on the spot about anything all the time. You know what I mean? Instead of waiting like in Australia four years or six years to kick the bastards out, now you get your say, you know, every week on whatever issue it is. And so, in, in that way, you don't you don't need the government to, having all that say, you know, and having the tax system the way it is. And then if you have a a government system run off the blockchain where you know that you have significantly less people then those two things can work in tandem where the people essentially become the government. I, I think you're absolutely right. This yeah. this new invention gives democracy a chance to actually happen. That's right, yeah. And uh, um, you know there's a real it, it gives us a chance to really communicate but with our with our value. Yeah. Basically um, Bitcoin and technologies like Bitcoin are uh, a language of value and it's a language language with which we can communicate with with the government yeah, and, it, right, yeah. and it really makes you know one of the first alternative uses to the blockchain is a, a fair and democratic voting system yeah. unimpeachable voting system right. the likes of which we haven't had so good point great point yeah. thank you for that um, okay so there was this this article that that talked about you know there's a um, you know in my opinion, government and economists, sometimes it, it seems like they're a little bit in, in cahoots, right? And in this case, well, um, amongst economists, it's kind of uh, dogma that deflation is bad because um, essentially their, their argument is that if you have a deflationary currency, you won't spend it because it'll be worth more tomorrow. And therefore, it, it it, therein lies the seeds of its demise. Uh, if people aren't spending it, then the economy doesn't doesn't move. And if people aren't selling their goods, they lower the price even further, which which fuels more deflation. 
and uh, there, therefore it's bad for the economy. And you need inflation in order to spur people, in order to coerce people into spending their savings, because otherwise they would hoard it. That's the that's the indictment of of deflationary currencies, right? Um, and uh, there, it's kind of down here at the end. I've got it highlighted. Such hoarding could threaten Bitcoin status as the medium of exchange, leading to its complete demise as a currency. That's what he leaves the reader with, right? And so, um, like everything else in good form, the Bitcoin community had its uh, um, its say. This guy is a very smart guy, Mike Hearn. He's one of the core developers for Bitcoin. And um, he goes on to, to really, in a very thoughtful way, totally dismantle the argument around deflationary currencies um, uh, basically being a bad thing. And he, he has examples like you know, the electronics industry. You, know, you used to have to pay $5,000 for a computer that is one one hundredth of the power that you have today. Um, the price for performance of computers um, increases uh, or doubles every 18 months. So we've seen a deflationary system in, in, our, in the technology and electronics industry, but it doesn't keep us from buying new laptops when we need them, right? He also uh, does a really good job of indicting the, the, the measurements that, that we use and that economists use to measure inflation, the consumer price index. I don't know if you guys are aware, but you know, be, because you can't really know the money supply, the money, the, that money supply graph that I showed you, that's just coins and, and dollar bills. It's the M1 money supply. And the actual money supply is orders of magnitude larger than that. But we don't know because money is created based on debt, based on the fractional reserve banking system that we have uh, on a nine to one ratio. So, and that's how money comes into existence. That's a whole other discussion. Um, but the upshot is that we never know exactly what the money supply is, so we can't do um, a, a rigorous inflationary number. We have to do the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, and send a bunch of government employees out to a bunch of shops. They have a clipboard, and they look at a can of peas, and they say a can of peas was a was dollar last month, and this month it's a dollar ten. And they do that all day, every day. Hundreds of, hundreds of employees running around with clipboards and looking at price tags. And, and then they publish this CPI uh, figure, and, um, and that's what they say is inflation. I mean, it's pretty subject to human influence, I would say. Great. So he, he, he indicts that here. And, um, and anyway, it's a really good uh, article. I highly recommend it. Um, he also points to his fact. Well, this is... For, for this, you can have this in your hand whenever you talk to Bitcoin doubters because they've refuted almost every everything in here. Um, this little piece is excellent. I won't bore you with reading it, but I'll post the link. Um, but essentially, it's a it's a very good explanation of why um, deflation will not kill Bitcoin, right? And then what's what's really cool about this is the Economist. It, actually, I love the the publication, The Economist. They have lots of great stuff. They're a very important, influential publication in the world, and they responded to this guy, <laughs> this little Bitcoin developer, core developer. They responded to his uh, his posting, which I think is just like they acknowledged his um, his argument, and I think that's huge. Yeah, it's, um, it's, not, it's not actually inflationary, is it? Because it's actually growing. It is growing. It'll grow for the next hundred years. Well, but and check this out. He says. I think Mr. Hearn may have misunderstood the piece's argument. It was not that deflation would would kill Bitcoin. Did you guys did you guys see what I what yeah, I highlighted? Yeah. The demise. Yeah. That's kind of like killing, isn't it? Like, doesn't that mean the same thing? I don't know. Um, uh, but Bitcoin could survive and indeed thrive without becoming the coin of the realm. So he's basically backstepping. Um, and then there's another paragraph that I thought was really interesting, and I'll read this for you if you'll bear with me. Uh, I. I understand there's a general lack of faith in official inflation statistics in, in the Bitcoin community, which is perfectly reasonable. What is less clear to me is the assumption that weaknesses in inflation statistics cause them to systematically understate inflation. There's good reason to expect that inflation is actually being overstated in some areas of the economy and presumably uh, overstated in others. Statisticians aren't very good at taking into account rapid movements in the quality of technological goods nor do they do a good job capturing when technology sends the market price of some good, like encyclopedias, for instance, to zero. 
On the whole, I'm inclined to believe that various biases generally offset each other so that the official inflation numbers are broadly reliable. Wow. That's a mouthful, but what he's saying is, well, you know, we don't really know, like, sometimes things go to zero and sometimes things inflate, and, you know, it's pretty much a good number, like, you know, they're eyeballing it, and then they're, they're making policy decisions based on these things. I mean, it's really, when you look under the hood, I mean, it's really kind of scary that they're, they're trying to, to figure out what the money supply is. They're making decisions like, uh, where, where was I? Where's my graph? Here. They're making decisions to do this based on, you know, a bunch of guys running around with clipboards and, you know, it being, like, basically good. Right. Or maybe it's okay. Those guys are like the empires, but the players are the traders. Well, that's the next point. This, that's the next point that I'm going to make is, you know, there's, there's something fundamentally different about Bitcoin because the supply is following this curve that everyone can predict. Um, what I want to just expose you to a little bit is the subjective theory of value of money, which basically states that, that money does not have any intrinsic value, right? It doesn't, uh, um, it only has subjective value between two people at any geographic location on earth and, and given the circumstances. So if Will is coming out of the desert and he hasn't had a drink of water in a week and I've got a glass of water, then this glass of water is worth a million dollars to him, and the and I'm willing to trade that. He, he may be willing to make that trade at that time because of the su subjective differences in our two circumstances. And that happens with every trade. And every, every time two people tr trade anything, they're essentially, um, it's a win-win situation. It's because one person's circumstances are different than the other person's circumstances, right? And the, any form of central control makes the, makes the argument that they need to watch the economy and create enough money for that economy to run, right? And do things like this, saying, well, we need to create more money in order for the economy to, to run. And Bitcoin runs in a fundamentally different way because it, it cannot grow um, capriciously. It can merely be divided. So Bitcoin can be divided into 100 million pieces, as we've said before. And if we need more tokens to trade more things, we can simply divide it. We don't need to create more money. We can sim simply divide what's already there. Um, and that's a, a fundamental difference between fiat currency and the old money that we use and, and this new form of currency, Bitcoin being the prime example. But it's, a, it's really a whole new paradigm about controlling the supply of money, which is what what I want to talk about, inflation, deflation, it's really about money supply. And with Bitcoin, everybody has um, an infinite supply because you can divide it infinitely. That's a question, well, right? So, well, actually, you showed in one. In one's actually coins and dollars. It doesn't include money in your bank. Okay. So, um, actually, Bitcoin is like the money in the bank. Yeah. Um, the second bit on this is... What if I said to you, can I write you an IOU for Bitcoin? Is that considered money? And if so, I'm inflating the supply of Bitcoin on IOU. Uh, that's true. Yeah, you, you can have an IOU. You can make an ETF. I mean, they're actually creating money with this ETF that we mentioned. Okay. Um, so it can be completely screwed up, right? If people do that. Right. right. Well, if, if people, but that's a system outside of Bitcoin. If I accept your IOU, that's the, the will IOU system. That's not Bitcoin. And I can decide to not use that or, or yes. Okay. Yeah? Well, yeah. I mean, it's up to us to be educated well, enough not to buy into such a system, though. Well, I mean, yeah. the, CF, the ETF thing is. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think it's way to that. I shouldn't talk about that. That's it. But I posit that um, the IOU would be for a reason. Like, IOU in a future time because you want to hedge against some risk. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you look at the current derivative markets, the, like the information I was getting when I was trading was actually the best, most honest guess, which the government will never tell you is that market is um, 100 years of world GDP. It was in the one quadrillion um, dollars zone, even mm -hmm. though the governments were reporting it as you know, 30 or 10 mm -hmm. trillion. Um, 
So that was the size of these sort of futures markets. Um, and like, I'm, I'm just curious whether or not it's going to play out into a really corrupted space again. Because it's just like gold-backed currency, ultimately. We had gold-backed currency. Bitcoin cannot, gold can't be inflated, nor can Bitcoin. But Right. Well, hopefully it'll be a different story this time because the, the reason that you needed the representative system for gold is because you have the carry costs of gold. You didn't want to walk around with a bunch of gold in your pocket. Mm -hmm. But I can walk around with my entire Bitcoin stash on my phone perfectly securely, get held up, somebody steals my phone, and, and I've still got my Bitcoin. And, and maybe that will keep the fractional reserve uh, tendencies <laughs> happening. But you know what? To be honest, I suspect that, that we will still see these things. Yeah, Most well, people that, aren't. That's a, well, that's exa this is exactly the perfect thing because, like, what happens if you put your entire wealth into one wallet, right? And so these startups right now, they will do cold storage, right? So mm -hmm. they're going to take your private and gonna key be... and put it in a vault because it can't be hacked because people right. are hacking. One in 16 Bitcoin, half a billion dollars out of the 8 billion market cap has been sold. So people are doing that. Well, we still need services around these things, and you know, most people are not going to sit around thinking about how to secure their bitcoins, nor do they want to. Um, so there will be services. How people pay for those services, or how they how much trust? Yeah. yeah, they can be they can be corrupted. You, it's the it's the recentralization of, of things. Yeah. But um, yeah, this is this is our teaching moment, though. As a as a species, we can have a teaching moment about money. And what it means to take personal responsibility, um, and and understand how how the energy that we that represents our personal contribution to the world, you know, our personal human contribution. How do we measure that? It's it's with money. Money stores that, and uh, how can we keep that from being corrupted? This is our moment as a species to learn about it. Um, so, anyway, um, we are right on the hour. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I've got a few more things to share after I turn the, the Google Hangout uh, off. But uh, um, any last-minute questions before we wrap it up? All right. We get together every Tuesday night here at Hubud in beautiful downtown Ubud in Bali. Um, please join us again. And uh, thanks for coming tonight. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.